how we get the balance right between uh, national and obviously European level and then global activity on this. So some thoughts on how you're working on that and then of course all of the issues essentially around the horizontal guidelines and making sure that we avoid giving Lindsay and her team more work in due course by making sure it's, it's got right in the, in the first instance. And any other issues you want to specifically come back to before we open the floor or, or give um, Katharina or Lindsay another bite at the apple? Um, so I'd, I'd like to be short to give people a chance to speak on the, on the standardization work we're doing. So um, uh, we're doing this with the help, the good offices of the European Telecom Standards Institute, ETSI. Um, but it's not about European standards, it's global. And it's not about telecom standards, it's IT telecom standards and inf information security standards and all sorts of other standards which are relevant to cloud. And it's not just about standards, it's about anything which has been through a, and this is referring to Lindsay's point, has been through a credible standardization process. And the official standards developing organizations are not the only source of credible open, sort of transparently developed standards. Actually, quite a lot of them coming out of, um, particularly in the IT sector, the vast majority of them are coming out of what we might call the informal forum consortia. Mm -hmm. And we're mapping the whole thing. And, and there's a very, it's, there was a very kind of interesting start to this process where there was a certain amount of um, concern, I think, on, on both sides about how the, the thing would run. But I note that the conveners of the <laughs> subgroups actually very often are from either sides of the table. So you see somebody from, say, the telco area where there's a lot of, of use of formal standards and somebody from maybe the IT sector sitting together and acting as co-conveners. It's, it's, it's not perfect. Nothing is perfect in this world. But I, I do think as a, as a as a way of a mode of operating for Etsy, it's been a it's been a really interesting and, and new experience, and one which I think they're they're learning from. The other thing to note, which is um, very important for us, is we're not about inventing standards. We're about mapping standards in this activity. We're not issuing or not aiming to issue any standardisation mandates. Actually, industry is doing a pretty good job of of creating a whole a range of of technical specifications which are, are working pretty well and filling up the gaps. The problem is that, that when you're trying to buy, and we, 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 we look at this from very much from the perspective of the, if you like, the corporate buyer, particularly the public administration that's looking to buy cloud services, how do you actually compare the services which are on offer? What are the standards to which they are referring to? Are these good standards? Do these meet my requirements? And so we're starting the work now of looking at this kind of decision in relation to a number of critical use cases and to start to answer these questions because that's the cre crucial question we need to answer if we're going to build the trust and confidence which will allow public sector CIOs but also private sector CIOs and, the CIO and people who are buying stuff for small firms to allow them to do this with confidence so they know that they're buying into a service which is based on a set of standards which may not be always one standard but might be there might be alternatives but they're roughly comparable that they that their due diligence obligations are covered that the appropriate um, uh, procedures have been followed and then there's a, there are back out courses there are exit routes um, and the, so it's a, it's a kind of a, a mature approach to uh, an emerging industry there, there is of course an, uh, a jungle out there and uh, some standards are there, some standards are there not. And what we could hope also for this kind of exercise is uh, we can start with use cases, but if we can then systematize that into different scenarios for provision, wh what standards do I need to look into if I'm see, buying uh, platform services uh, in direct procurement? Let's say that this is a one scenario. What standards will I need if I buy directly from a public cloud for something? Uh, and what are more important, what are less important? That, that, that could be of a great help, I think, for public procurers. And also on, on public procurement promoting standards, uh, we, we have at least this, uh, this comes of course from the, uh, from the European uh, regulation, that you can uh, refer to open standards in procurement 
but then you uh, have also to accept uh, offers that uh, refer to uh, parallel standards or a documentation for something that fills the same purpose. And that makes it a bit difficult for us, of course. So uh, uh, if, if there could be some kind of a more systematic uh, approach to standards that uh, sort of says, OK, this is a good, mature work about standards. This other thing is uh, some kind of standard. But I mean, I, I, I don't know if I'm talking about the ranging standards or something. It's probably a not very good idea. But, but they give, give some uh, guidance to the governments on how to find a way in this uh, jungle. But when we develop software standards, we tend to be dissatisfied with the idea that standards are sufficient because we need to also have compliance. So we need actually to have some kind of measures to certify that these standards are actually fulfilling uh, their purposes, which means that they are assuring the interoperability that we talk about. And I think this issue is becoming more and more uh, sensitive when we talk about clouds, because as you mentioned, exit cost would be decisive. And it is at that exit moment we realize that a standard may not have been completely uh, fulfilled or completed. Uh, what do you call it, implemented mm -hmm. in, in, your, in all its aspects, and then you'll learn it, and then it's too late. So what about the whole issue about compliance? So I will be a little bit the voice of open source, of course. And uh, uh, my question is, I, I hear uh, Katerina and uh, Lindsay speaking about a uh, standard that must be publicly available. And s some say friend also, fair, fair and non-discriminatory uh, licensing. But uh, what about uh, royalty-free standard also? Because I think that, uh, as you know, the open source model is taking a growing part of software, and software is an important part of cloud computing, of course. And uh, the open source business model is based on service and not on the management of royalty. It's simply impossible. It's not compatible to use a royalty uh, a friend licensing in open source implementation. So I think that uh, uh, any standard used in your, let's say, cloud application should be royalty-free, at least for open source implementation. And maybe friend for proprietary implementation. And don't say it will be discriminatory because uh, open source is a legal regime. So anyone can use it or you, make, uh, you can make dual licensing, one for open source implementation, royalty free, and another friend for proprietary implementation. That's my, my personal opinion. Of course, certification or uh, some kind of government accreditation may be a, an answer to that. And we have seen in British G Cloud that accreditation is widely used, but it's, <coughs> you need a quite a mature standard and uh, you need some bodies that could do it. You need resources. So uh, certification is a, is a good, good way of doing that, but it's, it's costly. And it also may, in some, in some cases, uh, distort the market because some suppliers will find it uh, more expensive than others, just to put it very, very easily. So uh, we, are, uh, we are very pragmatic in, in our country. So in many cases, we go also for audits, where, which may be done not, uh, not, very, uh, not like yearly or something, but at, at some points. And then maybe uh, audits for for um, uh, deviations, no, as as easy ways of uh, ascertaining whether you are actually complying with the standard or not. And of course, you will have to embed it in contracts somehow. That that will be the the first anyway. If you're using this or this method, uh, then open source approach. Um, we are not. Uh, we are using open source approach in some parts of government. It has been very popular some years ago. It sometime, somehow went, and the, the, the reason for that is uh, supply of competence. Uh, because open source approach, it's, it's, it's uh, all the advantages that you are mentioning uh, if you look into standards that are royalty, uh, re requiring royalties. But to use open source, you need actually a high level of competence at the local level, and that we are striving with. But on the compliance issue, I agree with Katerina in general. We have to be careful about 
uh, over certifying the space, which is an emerging space. Um, and what you need to do is, in Katarina's slide, she made the point about the risk assessment. So you need to look at what the risk is of loss of business continuity because if you exit or maybe the firm you're working with exits the market, gets bought out by another firm, stops supplying that set of applications, goes bust, all these kinds of potential business outcomes, which is difficult to foresee at the beginning of the process. And then you're left high and dry. What's the risk for you in that circumstance? And I think that's part of the risk assessment, the due diligence, which needs to be done. Um, and then the process of actually how you do the procurement so that you actually make sure you've got the appropriate checks and balances. But not all data involves that kind of risk. And what we see is where public sector has moved into cloud is areas uh, where there is a lot of ephemerality. So you know the, the, the services you're doing might be things which you can set up quickly, run with, and then close down, right? And we would be very keen to see um, a tiering of the, the data you're using in respect of the risk profile and actually have a very uh, very open approach using experimental films, open, open source, whatever, in the areas where there's no risk or very little risk. Mm -hmm. And um, this is in fact what's already happening, I think, to a large extent. I guess even inside of the public sector, there are a lot of people who are using cloud services for a lot of individual um, uh, provisioning that they probably haven't passed through their CIO and they haven't passed this through any kind of legal process. Uh, this is the reality, this is happening in corporates as well. The evolved budgets allowed people to do this. Um, what is the risk? Have they done a risk assessment? Probably not. Um, but it's just so easy to use and the business consequences of being able to have something up and running quickly are just very attractive. So people are kind of are probably sort of intuitively making these decisions without going through any uh, appropriate testing of, 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 the, uh, of, of the pros and cons. So it's one of these areas where I think we have to be quite open um, about allowing developments to happen without certifying things down, increasing the costs and driving out innovation. It's, it's a balancing act to achieve. I think on certification, I, I don't really have, have much to add. I mean, in terms of, of different models of standardization, um, of course, there, there are many different models um, of standardization about which we are largely agnostic. Um, I think that is a, a question in the first place for industry, and then we, we see in the take-up which standards uh, look to be, to be getting traction. Um, Friend is really only an issue, clearly, in situations where the holder of the IP wants to maintain a, a, a revenue stream through licensing. And where he doesn't want to do that, and we see a variety of, especially the, the American uh, industry-type consortia, where royalty-free licensing is, is also very common. So uh, strictly from a, from a competition perspective, I think that this is not not a critical choice factor, although obviously from a user perspective that may be very different. I have a question for both uh, Ken uh, and um, the lady, Madame de Bris, from uh, the Norwegian government. Uh, and echoing what you were saying about uh, staff in the administration uh, taking advantage of the free tools that are available out there, um, does, is the thinking both at the commission or member state level to develop an approach like uh, some governments have done already, a, a first uh, cloud-first type of approach on top and above what you're doing now is the cloud computing uh, uh, initiative in the commission and in, for example, in Norway with your specific effort. Is that a, a goal, maybe, maybe not today or maybe not in the next, uh, but you know, shortly, a goal to develop a government cloud-first policy like we have seen in the US, like we've seen, I think, in the UK to some extent and in other member states, not that the US is a member state. Thank you. Shouldn't Europe be creating its own cloud infrastructures? Is that a source of competitive advantage? Um, um, and the there's a report from, I think a recent report from the parliament that goes in that direction. So playing devil's advocate, I'd just like to pose that question, you know, in terms of the economics, uh, the way forward, is it global pro-competitive or should Europe be considering um, other options? Um, the uh, question from the um, 
before, focusing on the exit costs uh, in relation to uh, open standards is kind of a classic uh, example. I was thinking if the, there is any um, um, worry or hope in relation to the Commission's ambition to introduce a right uh, to data portability with the um, data protection regulation that is currently, currently being processed in the Parliament, whether that right will survive and whether that would have then implications on the standards discussion. Just uh, comment briefly on the, uh, on the uh, cloud first uh, question. We are aware that the uh, American administration has introduced this by Vivek Kundra. We've been speaking to people from American administration a couple of uh, one year after that was introduced and we had the distinct impression that it went off very, very quickly, but it's somehow flattened out. Uh, that's an impression, so I will not uh, say that this is uh, a real truth. In Norway, we are uh, looking at both carrot and stick, uh, and the uh, stick is a possible, uh, we call it use or explain policy, which will go for uh, some kind of uh, procurement of uh, cloud services on certain levels. That then will be, uh, that it will say either you use this or you have to explain why you are not doing that. This is uh, investigated right now and we have to, to uh, flesh out the consequences of going that way in certain segments of the market. Uh, but what we will do is a carrot and that will be guidance, that will be a common specification, that will be educational efforts, uh, awareness efforts. So that will be done anyway, and the, 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 the stick will, will trying to find out. Um, the European Commission is not in a position and doesn't want to be in a position to dictate to the member states how they're organising their public administration spend. The, the idea of the European Cloud Partnership is to set up a, a forum in which best practice can be compared, they can learn from each other, they can start to develop common technical requirements, maybe even joint procurement in order to pool the market power if appropriate and so on but actually this is something which is under member state control so that's that's the way in which we, we see the thing going forward interestingly um uh, katarina's point about the cloud first um uh, policy in the united states um they have also been using a little bit more stick so i understand last year there was an executive order which encouraged uh, cios to start purchasing cloud whereas they hadn't in the past by saying basically Listen, guys, your, your budget's been cut by 20% for next year. But if you use it for something innovative, like big data or cloud, you can have it back. So that kind of encourages them to move in this direction. All right. So there are, so are uh, maybe a kind of a, a, a gross uh, simplification of what they've been doing, but certainly appropriate incentives to get um, pr procurers into this area of, of trying out something new. And it's not easy. You saw that in all the lists that Katarina show. It's not easy. It's not an easy thing to do. Uh, maybe the way forward. A European cloud, a European cloud infrastructure. <clears throat> there will be a, uh, European cloud infrastructures. It already exists. And what we're seeing is that data centers are being cloudified, if you like. So the existing provisioning of, um, of services to both private and public corporates is moving towards the use of the virtualization techniques which are typical of cloud. Um, actually, it's interesting that the economics of cloud in terms of cost reduction stem not just from multi-tenancy, so that the increasing efficiency of use of a common infrastructure, and maybe about time shifting. So we all know this nice graph in the Microsoft paper which shows, you know, here's the computer uses in Europe and here's the computer uses in Japan. Wouldn't it be great if we could share this because we would be able to spend less money on, on data center capacities? <coughs> Actually, the vast majority of the savings really seem to come from automation of things which in the past required the intervention of a lot of human effort. So this is moving into the AP. This is moving moving enterprise software into the API environment. This is the fundamental change, and if we do this on the basis of software systems which are standardised, this is going to help us a lot because that means that the kind of you can construct your cloud solutions in a way which is rather stable. That's the economics of that. Now, if every public administration in Europe 
tries to do its own thing, it's, it's going to not work because of the economics are not going to kick in. Right? So what we want to see is the adoption of global approaches to these things. Um, and here I think uh, there's an opportunity for European providers to get into the game and, and start defining that next wave of what cloud looks like in terms of a really industrialization of the IT resourcing industry. Um, exit costs and the right to data portability and the data protection regulation, I, I don't really want to go there because we're really in a very sensitive discussion point uh, about this. You know, I think that these debates really are for the time being about uh, looking at policy environments and ways in which we can, we can maximize the chances of, of the cloud really taking off. Um, and I'm certainly, uh, Ken and Katrina are better placed to talk about that than I do. Um, I'm willing to take on the, the data protection question on the other hand, um, because I think that you know, in a data protection environment, any and all measures that can be taken to increase data portability can only be positive generally. Um, and from our perspective, if we think of some of the issues potentially of the future in terms of big data, I think it would be, uh, it would be good if measures like that survive, but that's very much a personal view. <laughs>